I've got all those beds in there because I felt sorry for you guys. So just grab a bed now. Okay, here we go, like five seconds, and oh. um, you're live. Alrighty, well hello, my name is Corey and I'm going to be showing you how to make your own font today, uh, at least a couple of the different methods. Uh, in uh, this PowerPoint presentation, it, it's, it's not really artistic looking, so there's a lot of people back at school would be rather disappointed in me for this, but that's okay. I lost my connection. There we go. There we go. <laughs> is, it, uh, is it on? Okay, all right. All right, um, well, let's get started then. Here. Uh, some definitions first uh, for those people who, uh, who, who might need them. Um, these are different terminology. Terminology is going to be used. Uh, letter form is actually just an individual letter um, or something that claims to be a letter. Uh, and we'll get into that later on. Uh, font is actually a set of letters uh, that share the same attributes. Um, so when you when you talk about a, a font family per se, you know, a lot of times it'll include a bold or italic or something like that. Um, but all the letters, uppercase and lowercase, if there's if there's lowercase, all have the same. Uh, they all share the same attributes. They all look the same and everything. Um, typography in general. Uh, one definition is the art of designing letters. I like to take it a little further and say it's the art of designing and implementing. You know, a typeface into a design. Um, some typefaces have very limited use when it comes to designing something. Others uh, um, have quite a broad range. So. Uh, history lesson, these are um, throughout time um, and all the way back to when they used to carve out type, you know, with, uh, you know, with, with ancient tools and they used to carve them out of stone and everything. Uh, there's, fonts have sort of evolved from, uh, you know, from one style to another. Uh, most of these, you know, had quite a long life, I would say, you know, and they sort of built off of each other. Uh, we'll start with the old style. Old style, uh, Garamond is an example of this font, um, and it closely resembles something that, you know, that I guess that you would have seen first. Um, you know, it's a nice font. It's got, uh, you know, it's, it's, the letters are very thin and everything, but, you know, it makes for a nice readable font, I think. Um, Times New Roman, obviously one that we all use as a default for any type of Word document that we create. Um, Times New Roman is a, you know, is a, is a font. It sort of builds upon the last font. The letters themselves are still very thin. Um, this, I guess, is, yeah, I mean, italic font. Uh, this is sort of an example of the italic font. I mean, all it really means is the letters are slanted to one side, uh, but a lot of times it's used to distinguish, um, you know, a particular word or something like that in, in a paper. Uh, transitional, uh, I'm trying to remember all of the, uh, information on, you know, sort of how these evolved, but um, perhaps this was more of just, you know, just for viewing, uh, less for me talking about. But as you can see, the letters themselves get a little thicker. Um, they look a little different. Uh, I'm trying to, I have no other information about that one. Um, we talk about modern fonts. Uh, Bedoni's a good example. Uh, Bedoni's a nice font. I like it an awful lot. It's more of a thicker font as well. Um, some, I mean, a lot of the letters look the same, but as in the case of like the Q, the Q has its little thing coming out the bottom of it. Um, it's something that has a lot more use, um, you know, for, for a lot of different kinds of design pieces. Uh, Egyptian fonts, these are a little bit interesting. Um, I think the other term is slab serif, that they're usually called, but uh, Rockwell's a good example of one of these fonts. Um, there's a lot of, uh, as you, it, it's, I'm trying to figure out how to describe it, but you know, the letters are very thick and, you know, they have a little, you know, out of each letter there's, you know, there's a little, I guess what the slab is, is a little thing at the bottom, like of the, the X and the, and, the, uh, and the F, for example. Um, so these have limited use, really. Uh, I don't use them very often. They're, I guess, appealing to the eye for some people, but it's not something that I typically see in the design that I do or the design that anybody else I know does. Um, sans serif fonts, this is sort of more of a modern font. Arial, which is actually just a knockoff of a font called Helvetica. Um, the sans serif font, and we'll get into what serif and sans serif fonts are in a sec, but this one's a pretty clean one. This is used for more of display, 
uh, you know, if you're trying to catch somebody's eye, you know, and make a big, you know, if it's just like one word or something, you know. Um, all right, sans, sans serif, sans serif, serif fonts. Um, they have little small elements um, to the ends of the main strokes, and where all the arrows are pointing is a good example of what I'm talking about. So they're more of just you know little design elements, but uh, serif fonts are used in you know most types of publication, uh, newspapers and magazines and everything like that. Uh, supposedly allows the uh, you know the person who's reading the article or whatever it allows them to read it easier. Um, I guess just because the letters connect more to themselves, uh, to one another, so it makes it a little bit more easier. Uh, and then serif or sans serif fonts um, don't have these small elements added to the end. They're just uh, and these are a bunch of different examples, but they're more used for display fonts. Again, you know, like a title. You know, for like if you had a title for an event, that would be the uh, you know a sans serif font would be used for the title itself and all your like information would probably be in a in a serif font somewhere on somewhere else on the page. Uh, let's see. Um, in my synopsis, I had something about uh, discussing 3D typography. Now, this is something that I've just gotten into recently. Um, you know, most people think typography is flat or two-dimensional. Um, dimensional typography makes you think about typography in terms of time and space. Um, time being like if, if it's some type of animation piece, you know, the way the type scrolls across the screen, um, whether it does any rotation or anything like that, that's a different way to look at it than, say, reading this right here. Um, space, because uh, you know, we'll get into the ways that uh, three typography shows, shows space, but if you're thinking about it, when you read this, these are flat two-dimensional letters in uh, 3D typography a lot of times. I mean, you have to sometimes walk around it, look at it from different angles uh, to get an idea of, of what it's like. Um, ways that letters have been rendered dimensional, and I'll try to get through the rest of this without too much longer. Um, extrusion, shadowing, sewing, and, and bloating. These are just four. There's a couple of other ways as well. Uh, extrusion, um, letter forms look as if they're stacked on top of each other. Um, sort of the way pages are stacked in a book. Uh, 20th Century Fox, his logo. Um, if you ever watch that animation, how it starts and then it goes around, you can see that the type itself sort of stretches out. Um, and it's the most often used method for showing 3D type. It's, it's powerful and expressive, but rather predictable, something that people use to gain people's attention. But there are other ways to go about it. Um, examples, it's going to be hard to see the one on the left, um, but that's a typeface that is extruded. Uh, the H that I drew the other day on the right there, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of times the extrusion of a, of, a, of a letter form will be, will go back a lot farther than this. But it sort of gives the idea of a 3D, you know, letter form, something that, uh, you know, something that you wouldn't normally see, you know, reading a magazine or something like that. Uh, shadowing, this is sort of another easy way to, to you know, to show a 3D typeface. It, you know, light source implies depth, so, and it's pretty common, common enough that, you know, a drop shadow option is in most page layout software. Um, you can, you know, put a drop shadow, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Quark Express, I believe, any of those. Uh, it doesn't usually look too good, though, especially if you're using it, you know, to produce some kind of, you know, print piece. Uh, it's sort of a cheesy way to, you know, to you know, to show what you're trying to show. Again, you'd never use uh, a shadowing technique if you were doing some kind of, you know, if you were writing, or if you're printing stuff, some, an article in the newspaper, you wouldn't want to use shadowing, of course, you know, on the words, because then you wouldn't be able to read anything. Um, here's an example, this font, uh, the, the dark, the darkness in the back there, that's sort of, that's a shadow, so it's sort of implying depth, even though the letter form itself could still be two-dimensional. Bell South Quest, well, that was kind of a pseudo. They stole somebody's stock to become a phone company. 
and then come over you know with it so as consumers we're always at their beck and call what do we want okay um, you're forced to have for DSL you're forced to have now they're starting to get away with it. in fact Verizon anybody in Verizon territory I can tell you a couple things <laughs> April 10th you're able to have DSL without a phone secondly if you switch over to Verizon kiss your copper Website in order. It's a little. It's buried, but you can find it. You can find it. It's not. It's not an advertised. Okay. Well, I'm an SBC AT&T affiliate, and I sell their new Direct Connect. As far as their, what they call their web partner program, I do roughly about somewhere between two to three thousand of those sales a month. People are calling me up. How do I get this cheap thing? Well, it's you can just go here, here, here. We show them how to do it. Put in my affiliate link. I make ten bucks, and off they go. Okay. But the problem it is there. But
presentation talk about it a little more. after the speech too if anybody's interested I might have to put them back together a little bit but um, I did create a, a 3D typeface out of Legos and I have a couple of examples in that bag over there which the plastic bag unfortunately hasn't kept them in one piece luckily <laughs> luckily it's a quick fix though um, and perhaps I Well, that's good. That's good. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, I really can't show anybody how to make a, a font, so without the... Uh, <laughs> it, it does. It really does, yeah. Um, I mean, there's, I suppose there's part of it I could... Uh Telecommunications and Internet, and I'll get right back to the network neutrality. We're going to be screwed here in roughly about 60 days. If SBC gets a hold of Bell South, and we're supposed to know something within the next 60 days... This power strip. <laughs> Tripping no, power strip. Totally, but that power strip trip. Andrew, I had to reset it. It's tripping, man. Tripping. <laughs> Lots of tripping. <laughs> oh, well, that, perfect. What do you do with fonts for a living? Oh, well, I'm actually a graphic design student, um, but I've had a lot of interesting projects uh, lately in design class, and one of them involves sort of creating your own fonts. Um, even though there is a million different fonts to choose from out there, sometimes you just want something a little bit more personal. Um, yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Um, you can only find so many free and useful fonts on the internet. Some of them do cost money. Um, do you see, like, I should mention about the cost of some fonts. Yeah. Do people ever just, like, make their own, like, oh, yeah. links and just call it a day? I mean, why would you need Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. Uh, a lot of times, you know, just, I guess it's what you're, you know, where you're working at um, or what you're designing. Uh, because, you know, I mean, a lot of the reg regular commercial fonts, like all the fonts that you find preloaded into any Adobe, you know, or layout, page layout program, those are a lot of times the fonts that are used the most anyway, uh, basic serif and sans serif fonts. So it works out, well, a lot of times people, I guess, if you're not too inclined to find a, a font that's a little bit different, you might just take the default anyway. So that's probably why those ones, those ones are used the most. But... Um, all right, I got, we're back up. All right. Yes. All right, so the next way that a uh, uh, typeface is usually, um, you know, switched up a little bit to make it three-dimensional. It's a technique called sewing. Um, stroke of a letter is interpreted as if it was like a strand of a ribbon. Um, twisted and folded letter forms uh, suggest dimensional typography, just the way the, the you know, ribbon type's texture goes. Uh, I'll show some examples here. Um, this might be a little hard to see uh, for some people, but um, these are you know, letter forms created. They have all kinds of floral patterns and things around them. Um, and the way the floral patterns are drawn can suggest uh, dimensionality to it. Here's an example of a, you know, sort of a you know, ribbon font. The way the, the ribbon sort of folds in under and over itself um, suggests dimensional typography. Uh, bloating is the last uh, uh, technique I'm going to talk about to sort of create a 3D letter form. Um, and it's something I'm sure some of you have seen before. It's sort of like a balloon-like quality um, uh, where it looks like the letter form has, you know, been blown up with air in it, sort of like a balloon. 
Um, other words, uh, all kinds of bulbous, organic, inflated, biomorphic, those are just other words that you can use. Um, the one on the left, that word, um, it's used some kind of liquid, but as you can see, it's sort of the, the shadows of the light sort of suggest dimension, dimensionality. Um, my lovely drawings on the right there, um, they are sort of, I'm talking about the sort of the balloon effect, um, different shadows and whatnot sort of creates a, an illusion of three dimensionality. Um, shadows, but not the same kind of shadows I was talking about, the drop shadow thing, um, that's a little bit different. Uh, 3D typography, this is sort of the last thing I believe other than examples and I can actually show some techniques for creating your own know, typeface. 3D typography, um, these are some of the issues uh, that, that you know, need to be addressed with it. Um, what role does it play on the printed page? Does it even belong on the printed page? Um, that's a good question. It's one that is really difficult to answer. Uh, if it works for some sort of printed piece you're doing, then I guess so, but a lot of the times it's sort of you know, people would be hesitant to use a three-dimensional typeface in a, uh, you know, on a flyer or a poster or something like that. Um, what is uh, 3D typography's impact on language? Um, how does the typography work as a system of letters um, that form words? I mean, is it readable? Is it legible? Um, that's the next thing. Uh, last thing is, does a 3D typographic object, does it even need to be a letter form? Um, can it just be some sort of interesting shape, something abstract? Does it have to be um, something that has to be used uh, to spell out a word? Uh, here's an example, um, uh, sort of a 3D uh, uh, type typeface. Uh, this one isn't, it's not very 3D, it's somewhat 3D, uh, but it's used out of old tools and old pieces of different fabric. Um, that's sort of another example. You can see the J, K, and the L. Um, I think there's an R down at the bottom there. Um, the one on the left, I think, was computer generated, and that's sort of another way to go. Um, 3D modeling programs, you know, you can create, you know, whatever you want with those, and you can create your own, you know, typefaces and whatnot. The one on the right, that's sort of, uh, I'm not sure what that's made out of exactly, but it's sort of an example of the extrusion technique I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is my typeface, my 3D typeface, made out of Legos. It was an obvious choice for me because I have so many Legos at home and I hadn't had any use for them in, in a long time. Uh, the B and the N, um, just not only was the, the way that I built the letters themselves, but again the idea of, you know, being a 3D typeface, you have to sort of walk around it and, and you know, take it in from different views and that's where you know, shooting it with a camera, as I had to for class, that's where it gets really tricky. Um, now onto the uh, camera, or the uh, intro to photography thing last night, because my pictures need a lot of work. So, um, that's sort of a way you can, with a 3D typeface, you can take, you know, a million different pictures, and it can look different, you know, different ways. Um, the one on the left is a J, the one on the right is an O, and the O, sir, I think, shows a good example of how you can sort of look through it and you can still see part of it in the back there, part of the, the actual letter form. Um, you know, with Legos there's a lot of different kinds of pieces, uh, movable pieces, pieces you can use to create different angles and stuff, which makes it, I think, ideal for creating a 3D typeface. Um, an S and a T, um, and I'm just saying what they are because, uh, you know, the question again with 3D typography, you know, people are going to have a hard time sometimes realizing what it is and that's sort of the challenge. And then again, if no one could recognize that as an S or T, would it actually be a letter form to them? Or would it just be some sort of abstract object? Um, this is uh, a three-dimensional typeface that a girl in my class made um, with little, di little cubes and fish and the little uh, flower stuff that you put in there um, for the fish. And what's cool about this is the fish swimming around in there. I mean, not only is the way you look at it, um, different, but the fish swimming around there sort of move the letter forms themselves, so the letter forms could look different if you come back later on in the day. Um, would have been cool to, to, you know, have a couple of those here to show you, but someone killed all her fish, so um, unfortunately I can't do it. I can't show it. Um, all right, let's see. All right, that is, I'll come back to that. All right, to actually get to some techniques now, um, which would be nice to show people, let's see if they're actually, here I got to get used to this uh, bigger screen, uh, let's see, I'm going to 
close this window up for just a quick sec here. So let's see if my files might have closed. Alright, let's just open these individually. Okay. As long as it's showing it. Um, at used to the 640 by 480 resolution. Uh, Alright, so here's one way um, to go about it. Um, this might, uh, you know, this sort of, this way sort of reminds me of uh, uh, Mario Paint, the video game for the Super Nintendo. It had an option. Um, you could create different, different characters and stuff by filling in different squares um, to create different characters and whatnot. Well, you can do the same thing with letter forms, actually. So, you know, all of these, everything, everything about this grid right here, um, you know, you can manipulate, you can fill in the little boxes, and you can create boxes of all different sides if you want to really get, you know, interesting, you know, letter forms and whatnot. I just created these rather big boxes just to show the effect, but, you know, these right here, I mean, if you wanted to switch up, like, you know, make an H and you didn't want the little uh, slab surf things here, all you have to do, um, and, you know, I, I wish if I had the time I'd go over some of these tools and this is uh, Adobe Illustrator and it's a great program for, for creating this type of thing. Um, but all they are are just little squares in a grid um, and you fill the square in and whatnot and create a completely different H. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, you know, create a different letter form, you can always just unfill out the squares. Um, like so. Uh, actually, I could do more than one at a time here. Forgot about that. At least I should be able to. Make sure I'm pressing the right button. There we go. And another. Uh, you can get, you know, really, you know, you know, interesting uh, letter forms. You can create some letter forms pretty easy, actually, um, using this technique. So, you know, the E becomes a C, and whatnot. So. Um, this is just one method. It's a method I think is, you know, again, fairly, fairly easy, fairly quick. Um, and you can get some pretty interesting letter forms. The A down here sort of reminds me of uh, some sort of creature from Space Invaders or something like that. Um, but again, you can get pretty creative using that technique. Uh, yeah, here's a technique I'm going to show that's uh, pretty easy for just creating different uh, interesting textures. There's a brush tool um, in Illustrator as there is in other programs like Illustrator. Um, and Illustrator and Photoshop each come with a, a bunch of preset brushes. Uh, you can obviously download more brushes off the internet. But the brushes that are available are pretty pretty cool, I think. Um, I just need to find whether they're highlighted or not. Here we go. Maybe I can find a cool one here. Um, and this is a way like, alright, so I'm creating an S there, and that's a crappy looking S, but the brush itself is neat. So then, you know, you have something that, you know, has I guess a little bit of dimensionality to it and something that's a little different um, than maybe what you thought it was going to be. Uh, I can create a couple more here. Again, a crappy W becomes something more interesting with the brush technique itself. Uh, I'm not actually spelling anything, but... Um, let's see. So I mean that's something cool. I can try a different brush here, I suppose. Let's see what let's see what I get with a different brush. So create an H. So that's a little. I mean that's a little hard to tell, but that it's an H. But it's sort of the idea. Um, you know, is you can create stuff pretty easily that way. Here it is. Okay, I already showed those two. Let's see what else I got here. Um, all right, another way, um, so create your own font is to take an existing font or existing typeface that already exists, and there's a tool in Illustrator um, that allows you to. Let me zoom in here. This tool allows you to sort of take the letter form itself, uh, what you first have to do, there's an option in Illustrator, allows you to create outlines which then makes the text uneditable in terms of you know changing it using the type tool, but what it allows you to do is sort of go in and each one of these little points you can manipulate and sort of stretch and do things with, so 
you know, if you wanted to create an interesting looking Y that's a little different. I don't know. <laughs> you can you could do that. Um, you can make you know slight variations, or you can make something completely different. And you know, it's taking an existing font and sort of putting your own spin on it. So again, you could just stretch out the E a little bit, um, or you can do like what you did with the what I did with the Y and make it completely different, completely weird, and everything. Um, yes. Yeah. What kind of licensing are there? Are there licensing on fonts where you can't edit them and put it out? Or? Yeah, I I believe there is, um, but I think uh, I think if you manipulate enough, um, perhaps to where it's you know unrecognizable, then I think it's fair game. Because um, I I'm quite sure that the fonts that I've found there are some that look like obvious fonts to me, where someone just added something a little bit different. Um, yeah, that's something I guess you know. The more I create different fonts of my own, I should you know find out about just to make sure that that I'm not getting in trouble. Like I would say that the Y I create, if it even looks like a Y to anybody, um, would be okay. I mean, it's taking the the Arial font and you know manipulating it and creating uh, something that doesn't even look like like you know the original Y that was there. So uh, I would say this is fair game. I would say if it's a small manipulation, you. Uh, it might require some type of, uh, you know, permission from somebody, but I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. There's another way that I want to show, and this is the way that I think is the most personal um, way to do it. And all it really takes is some time, a uh, pencil, a piece of paper, and a scanner. Um, you can just take a piece of paper and a pencil and, and draw your own letter forms, um, draw your own images on a piece of paper and then if you, know, if you have a scanner, scan them in um, and then try to duplicate with using the program like what you drew and it doesn't have to be exact like you know when you're drawing a lot of times you're not going to have everything at a perfect angle, things are not going to be the same width if you're creating an H, you know one side of the H might not look exactly like the other side of the H. That's where the program comes in handy because you can use rulers and things like that to make edges straight. So I was just messing around creating different letter forms. Um, there's a squiggly C and a D here. And using the pen tool, or the, uh, yes, the pen, uh, the pen tool in Illustrator, allows you to do is um, on a separate uh, layer, or the same layer if you want, um, allows you to sort of go in and sort of trace what you did on the piece of paper. Um, you can trace it with uh, with precision and then any kind of, like I said, any kind of, you know, weird things that were there before. Um, when you were trying to draw it, you can sort of smooth out, again, using the ruler or whatever. So, I mean, this is a cool way to, to get really personal. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of, like, if you're going to make your own font, like an entire you know, family of letter forms and upper, lower case, maybe numbers, maybe, you know, exclamation point, you know, question mark. Um, you want to, you know, obviously have, have a little bit of, uh, you know, drawing ability in order to get, you know, the letter forms to look very similar. Again, you can edit them in the program, but it's good to have them looking fairly, you know, fairly the same on the piece of paper to start it off. And that's sort of where it's tricky. But, you know, perhaps, again, you know, making a complete font isn't, you know, does you know isn't isn't all all that important? Maybe just making individual ladder forms. Uh, you know, I think the fun thing is just playing around, drawing. I mean, if you're not a great drawer, I'm not a great drawer, but you can still do some interesting things. Um, and I think you know, the more you do it, obviously, I think you you know you'll be surprised at how good you can get at doing this. So, yes, Jeff. Oh, that's good. You know, I don't know if I've ever gotten that far with, I don't recall if I've ever gotten that far with any of mine, but there seems to me there was a program called Font Grapher. I think it might have been made by Macromedia. Um, but yeah, I have no idea how, how you know, what, that, what that's like. I, I think at work we had it at one time, but I haven't been able to find it. So um, at this point, I would, I, I would have to imagine that either Adobe or Macromedia or one of those two companies would have something. Otherwise, I'm sure there's something, you know, there's some kind of shareware or freeware online that you could probably find. Um, 
So, yes. Earlier you had mentioned that you don't like using drop shadows in order to make the shooting. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I use it a lot where I work because well, it works well. So, yeah, people yeah. expected people in the way work. People expected people are comfortable with it. Oh, yeah. Sure. What do you rather use? Because obviously it works. It's, it's not original, as we all know. What do you rather use than use drop shadows? Well, earlier, you know, I talked about do, using just, you know, I mean, an effective font, something that's e that you can easily read and something that, you know, you have the option of being able to make bold and, and, and italic and. You know, something that's that will go well with the rest of the design. I think the way the piece is designed is what re is really going to, you know, make or break it. And I think you know, having a, a font that's readable but exciting too. Like there's a couple of cheesy fonts that I like. There's a font, the circus font, which has very limited use, but you know, the letter forms themselves are pretty cool looking. And I, I think it creates a nice effect. But again, it would only look good on a circus type poster, I suppose, and nothing else. Um, so I'd say you know the font choice itself would make a difference, and certainly the hierarchy of you know how the uh, is it ten minutes okay all right um, the hierarchy you know of the of the of the title and then you know the first heading and the body copy itself um, I think that that would make a huge difference too uh, it, you know it's sort of tough because I know there's a lot more that I still need to learn, and I know at work. You know, all of us have had most of the or most of the design classes, so we know what to use and what not to use. But I guess there's probably there's an effective way to probably use everything, even if it is cheesy. It just, um, you know, we like to think you know of a font like Comic Sans as being completely bad, but it does have its use, albeit limited. And I guess it's impossible, I think, to expect you know as a designer to expect people who are not designers, you know, to you know to use a to, to know, you know, not to use a particular font or, or, or whatever. And, um, again, you know, that's, that's what's tough about any font that you create a 3D version of, because then, again, does it belong on the page? Is it something that is going to be readable to people? So I guess it just depends. Yes, Mark? Back when the lecture was going on, you were telling me that your, grad, your design teachers and everything said that, you know, the Bush Cheney logo was much more effective than the, you know, the Harry Edwards logo. Could yeah. you explain, like, what, what made well, um, I think the main point was simply if I'm trying to remember what it looked like. I mean, the Bush logo, the font itself, um, I, I forget whether it had any sort of extrusion to it at all, but it was a thicker font. It was bold, um, sort of implied strength. It sort of implied, uh, well, I'm sure it implies something different to everybody, but I could see the idea they're going with. This is a font that, you know, it was bolder. It, you know, the flag, it had the flag, I think, either behind or in front of it or something like that. It sort of just signified, to me at least, a signified strength and confidence. Um, and that's what a bold font can get you. Um, and you can get away with throwing a drop shadow in there and it sort of gives it more, you know, it gives it more strength and, 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 and power. But, you know, there are other ways to do it. I, I didn't hate the, the Carrie Edwards logo either, but it was something where I, I could understand, you know, the the bold font being a reason for 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 that being more more prominent. Uh, whether or not it had anything to do with why he won or not, I, I have no idea. Um, you never know. It'd, it'd be funny if he won based on the you know the logo that he had for himself, but I doubt it. Um, all right, so th those are the uh, the different ways that I have. Um, certainly, there are other ways, but I think these ways allow for quite a bit of flexibility. Um, and I, I definitely think when you draw something yourself and you take it in the computer, then you can say, you know, it is yours. And then, you know, learning how to use this uh, program in Adobe Illustrator isn't too difficult. Learning it, I think, learning the basic things is easy. It's one of those things where it's easy to learn and tough to master because there's a lot to this program and there's a lot to being able to create fonts. Um, i go back to my PowerPoint presentation. I'll finish up with what I had. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember which one I was at here. Okay. Um, so this is a, a two-dimensional typeface that I, uh, um, that I created last year. The idea um, was to take um, some sort of tool that wasn't a pen or a pencil or a paintbrush and use it to try to create a, a typeface, something that, you know, is uncomfortable to use, but you learn how to use it just like a pen or a pencil. So this was actually done, um, 
using an X-Acto knife and I would dip it into ink. So that's how I got the, the obvious uh, scratchy lines. And a lot of people thought that this was a, a rather intimidating typeface because it was something that maybe you'd find on a ransom note or something like that. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I could see it. Um, I think in the idea of creating a you know a font you know a complete font, uh, which this isn't. This is just I believe the, just all capital letters, but is to make them look similar. So I mean I might have gotten away from that with a couple, but um, the basic idea is the same throughout throughout all of them. Um, this is using the same technique with the ink, um, Exacto ink, or Exacto knife and ink. Um, this time I turn the Exacto knife to its side and I use the side of the X-Acto knife, so um, and these are all, well, these are actually a mix of upper and lower case, but the idea is sort of the same. Um, you get nice little smearing effects and stuff like this. Um, and to show you that you can actually use a font you create for something useful um, in a design, um, this is a uh, promotional, promotional materials for a fictional event um, for, uh, you know, trash cleanup for a city. Um, now I added, you know, images that I took my own of, of, of trash and different things like that, but it's using the actual typeface I created, um, sort of implying, you know, messiness and trash being messy and the city being messy, let's clean up the city. Um, again, using it just for, for the header for this, for this particular event because I don't think it would work as body copy, I think it would be very difficult to read. Um, so this is a poster and, and flyer and these are two postcards. Um, for it, uh, the front and the back. So, you know, I mean, it, it is cool and it is possible to use a, a typeface that you create uh, or a font that you create, you know, that you can actually use. Um, and it just gives you, you know, it gives you something else to, to use instead of using, you know, the default fonts, again, that, that come with the programs. Uh, this is just my thank yous, including happy birthday to Mark. Oh, I forgot to say happy birthday to you earlier, so I apologize. Um, and that's pretty much it. I can take any questions that anybody has. If anybody's got anywhere. With, yes, sir. With the font you made in there, um, you know, because you obviously you scanned that one in, I'm assuming since you did with an exact Yeah, one. yeah. Um, how did you, how'd you transpose that from, uh, you know, the, the digital copy you scanned uh -huh. into using it within, do you cut out the letters within the scan? Or? Yeah, and that's, yeah, I, um, if I remember correctly, I think I was in uh, just Photoshop and I would, uh, um, yeah, I think I cheated and used what's called the magic wand tool, which <laughs> doesn't always work, you know, because uh, sometimes there's a lot of different shadows in, in color. Like for an image, a lot of times it'll eat into little parts of an image that you don't want. But I think just because mainly the page I had was just black ink and, and white paper, I think that's how I did it. So, oh, Okay, all right. Yes? How did you, if you haven't used a font program to make a font, Yeah. The, the the actual the, the the whole design or just the uh, typeface itself. Oh. I, I mean, how did you how did you put together taking off the track? Oh well, um, you know, I might have created actually. I'm trying to remember now. This this it was like a year and a half ago that I did that, but I think I might have created individual files for the, for each letter. Um, that's something I I, I think I, I did it. Either that or I just I just would crop like in Photoshop. Um, I would crop like the A, you know, say the file, or just copy and paste it from one program to another, then un go, go undo crop, you know, and then go to the next one. But you can get it where you can cut out the white background uh, using tools in, the, in Photoshop, and then you can, you know, you can move the file, or the font, however you want. So, and then you can slant it, do, do everything that you could, could do with, with a regular font, you know, regular digital font that you'd find on there, so. I think there's a, there's a certain creative portion of what you did with the exact and I, things like that. Yeah. The mechanical side of things is the, I believe, correct for me, the laying between the characters mm -hmm. is making the uh, adjustments between the different characters. Yeah. The I, what's different than the A. And yeah. 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 Um, you know, again, the, the same rules are the same sort of things that apply with you know, with a regular font will apply, uh, you know, with, with any one that you create, if you plan on using it in, in anything, any kind of promotional material, I think so. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, that, you know, that's, you know, being, part of being a good designer is if you're going to create your own font to be able to still remember all the principles of, of how to lay out the type. Because um, if you get away from that, then, you know, whatever you create is going to look pretty unprofessional, regardless of how much time you've put into the, 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 
the letter forms itself. So, um, what's it? Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, that's all I have. Thank you guys very much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, any, if you guys want to talk about any of this stuff after the speech, I'll be right outside. So I'm more than happy to discuss anything design related, whatever. So thank you again.